Good morning, Saints. It's great to have you here today at Chapel on Tuesday, April the 16th. Hey, there's been a slide right there. That slide right there says we are looking for nominations for the Servant Leader Award. I think this award is the most prestigious award on campus because it focuses on our mission. Today is the last day for you to nominate. So go take a look at your email, click on the link, and nominate somebody for Servant Leader Award. We'll be voting on those next week. So today is the last day for nominations. Next week we vote. Thanks for being Servant Leaders. Morning, church. Hey, uh, last chapel before Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Yeah. Hey, let's stand up on our feet. We have a, a guest speaker that uh, Brandon Bradley is going to introduce to us here in a few moments. But in the meantime, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship and for hearing God's word through prayer. Okay? Father God, you are awesome and holy. We praise you, Father, for uh, the good gifts that you are pouring into our lives. Uh, gifts of mercy, gifts of grace gifts of service to do in your kingdom, Father, and gifts of time together with the community and praise you. And may you bless our time as we participate in that today. In Christ's name, amen. I was broken 
Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh. 
through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, revealed to you in heaven, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been dismayed in, by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with the joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtained as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. again. Emmanuel. Okay, we're starting to wake up here a little bit. That's good. We just sang about this risen Savior and declared that death has no claim on you. Isn't that not awesome? And they're like, yeah, God's with us. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Come on. It's awesome to be able to worship Jesus and celebrate his name. It's also awesome to be able to get reunited with old friends who've had a, a, a big impact on uh, your life and ministry, and that's, that's what today really is for me. Uh, here in just a moment, uh, Phil Claycomb is going to come to the stage. He's somebody who uh, is acquaintance, a friend that I didn't see coming. I moved to Texas after I graduated from school here uh, to take uh, the pulpit at a, real, uh, a small church in McKinney, Texas, which is right outside of Dallas. And honestly, the, the church had so many issues, and, and it, it was so beyond me. And God put several individuals in my path who I, I, I really didn't have a direct relationship to, but they became my coaches and mentors while I was there. One of them is Phil. Uh, his role with Nexus, he's the president of Nexus Church Planting. We were not a church plant, but he immediately recognized that what God was doing was he was planting a church within the heart of this old congregation that if, if, if it didn't embrace that, it was going to die. And so he became this vital resource, encouraging me, coaching me. He's a man who has so much to teach and share. Uh, he's going to be sharing in a few classes here in chapel. But I want to invite you, whether it be at lunch uh, around noon or later in the afternoon around 2 o'clock, if you have some time uh, stop by and see him in the lunchroom or in the afternoon. We're going to be in the Harvest House. Get to know him. He's got some exciting internship opportunities he'd love to talk to you about. He'd love to hear if you're interested in church planting or just being involved in a, a ministry of some sort. Uh, that's why he's here. He has such a heart to see God uh, work in new ways in different communities and invite people along for the journey. Uh, if you think that there's even a remote possibility, that might be you. 
I want to encourage you to spend some time with him. So let's welcome Phil Claycomb to the stage. He's got a message for us to share. We're starting a series, I understand, called Battle Ready. It's on the armor of God. And what I would say is my experience in ministry is, is that what I need and what I think you need to face the battles ahead, whether you leave here to go into ministry or to go into some other vocation, is you need a sufficient spirituality. Sufficient. You need one that just, it, it ekes by maybe. It's sufficient. A way of being that works in the moment of need. You need a relationship with God that actually it, it delivers. It's sufficient. I know I'd rather have an overwhelming spirituality, a, a staggering spirituality. I'd like to have a lofty and amazing spirituality sometimes, awe-inspiring. But there are days in ministry and life life or ministry, where I'd be willing to settle for just sufficient today. <laughs> I'd like to just get by. Uh, I want a sufficient uh, a, a spirituality that at least rises to the occasion. It's adequate, competent, capable, useful. I'd like a, a spirituality on occasion that's just up to snuff, and it delivers what it promises. It rises to the occasion. It stands up under the strain. It's solid. It's reliable. It's dependable. Just simply sufficient. And what we need is, is to build a spirituality in ourself. And as we begin a series, you begin, I'm just here for one week, but as you begin a series in this uh, look at the whole concept of the armor of God and being battle ready, I'm going to suggest that what we need is a spirituality that is true. True. Reliable and dependable. Paul called on us to put on the full armor of God. And in Ephesians, he said we have to be battle ready. He said in Ephesians 6, 13 and 14, Therefore take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on, and he starts with, the belt of truth. And you're going to need that. Now, my experience in ministry is different than most. Most of the people, I suppose, who come here, they've worked in established churches. I was in Cincinnati Seminary, and I got advised by three of my professors, pulled me in a room one day when I was about 23, 24 years old. The advice was, Phil, you should never go work for an established church. And I thought, why am I here then? <laughs> and then they said, you need to go start them. Your temperament is not such that it's going to work out well in an established church. And as a 23 or 24-year-old, I will say that that was true. I think I've outgrown it now. I'm 58 years old, and about a year ago, I finally took my very first job at an established church. I'm trying it out. So my experience with you is I have experience in starting new churches myself, having daughter churches start, coaching new churches, working with churches all over the country. And what I would say is we need to get this truth thing belted around us. We've got to figure out how to get ourselves battle ready and have the truth put on in a very powerful way. Because truth is an abundant commodity these days. However, the problem is it's thought to be a rare commodity. People don't believe in truth anymore. It's kind of like the magic in the Harry Potter series. There's magic going on throughout the entire story, but some of the people who are there have trained themselves not to see the magic. What do you call those people who can't see the magic? Muggles. We've got an entire culture of muggles all around us, people who are very smart and bright, and they rely on truth all day long, but if you ask them about it, they deny it's there, right? They don't want to believe that anybody, especially God, can deliver truth and tell us the way things are, so they don't want to see the truth, therefore they can't see the truth. It's like when Jesus was with people, Jesus kept saying, if you've got eyes to see, let them see, because there's a whole culture around us that have eyes, but they can't see the, thing, the plain truth right in front of them. They've got ears, but they can't hear the plain truth that's being spoken by the Word of God, and they've got hearts that aren't receptive to the truth. So how do we put on the belt of truth? Well, I'm going to suggest a very personal way that I learned to do years ago, and I want to recommend to you because it's not just a personal thing. I think it's old school Christianity. I think we put on the belt of truth by going to the Psalms. For 1,800 years, the church's advice was simple. If you want to grow, pray the Psalms. If you were Catholic, you prayed the Psalter. If you were a monk or a nun, you said the offices on a daily basis. If you were a Protestant, you prayed the Book of Common Prayer, which was largely the Psalms. In the Psalms, God's given us 150 prayers for all occasions. Depending on what you have to face today, there's probably a Psalm that applies and it would fit. And technically, these prayers are not God's words to us as much as they're the words of God given to us to speak to Him. And so we pray psalms back to God and we dis discover that as we immerse ourselves in the ways of the people of God for thousands of years, 
the belt of truth suddenly comes around our waist and we get stronger and we understand this is what it is, that's not what it is, and we're able to take a stand against the, the muggleness of our culture and the way it impacts us. You can consider the precedence of how people prayed the Psalms in Scripture. When Mary was told she's going to have a baby without a husband involved, she said a prayer. It's in Luke chapter 1 and 2. She basically stole almost every line from the Psalms. When Elizabeth, her older family member, was told she's going to give birth to John the Baptist, she said a prayer. And so did Zechariah, her husband, and they stole almost every line from the Psalms. Remember Jonah? He was in the belly of the fish, chapter 2, and what did he do? He prayed and he lifted every line from the Psalms. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he do? He prayed the Psalms as he was dying. If you approached your homework the same way that they approached their work, you'd get kicked out of school for stealing words. It's plagiarism. But they went to the Psalms when they found themselves needing to pray, when they needed truth, bedrock truth, when they needed sufficient spirituality in their life, where'd they go? They went back to the words of God. They went back to the Psalms. And in Acts chapter 2, we read that the early church got together and they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and what else? It doesn't say just prayers. It says the prayers. What prayers would they have had? Right here, the Psalms. My personal story of getting familiar with the Psalms is I was planting my first church and I decided I needed to be more spiritual. That's always a good assumption. You could always work on that. And I decided this year I'm going to commit myself to a spirituality guide. It was called a guide to prayer for ministers. I'll try that out. I promised God I would do it. And then I got into it and realized I don't really like this. But I had told God I would. Every day I had a reading, every weekend I had a reading. They had quotes from different readings all over history. They pulled out authors' quotes on different topics. I liked all of that. The part I didn't like was is it had me read a psalm every day. Now, I grew up in a part of Missouri where boys were not encouraged necessarily to read poetry. Go figure. But all of a sudden, every day I'm supposed to read a psalm, and I'm supposed to read one psalm for an entire week. And the way it worked out for me was they'd assign me a psalm, say it's number 31. I'd read it on Monday and go, yeah. Okay, I got that over with. Tuesday, eh. Wednesday, ah. Thursday, uh uh-huh. Friday, yeah. And then three or four weeks later, I might be in a hospital room or in a meeting or with somebody who needed some advice, and guess what comes to mind? The psalm that I didn't like is suddenly now part of my life. Truth had belted itself around my waist. But we all need help moving from the pre-prayer to the just-in-time prayer And to do that, we have to put the belt of truth on because we can't get there directly. We've got to go through some means of getting there. And I'm going to suggest that you open your Bible with me. Let's go to the beginning of the Psalms, the front porch, the foyer to the Psalms. Let's look at Psalms 1 and 2 because what we have in Psalms 1 and 2 is we don't so much have prayers, but we have pre-prayer. We have preparation for prayer. We have a couple of poems, a couple of prayers that get us to the point that we can pray. And I'm going to suggest that when we bring in the belt of truth into our lives, we have to move from distraction to attention. And that's what Psalm 1 is all about. Moving us from being distracted by all the stuff that's around us to putting our attention on the one thing that matters most. And Psalm 2 moves us from feeling intimidated to having adoration, from intimidation to adoration of the one who came on God's behalf. They ground us in truth. Psalms 1 and 2 can gird us with truth. They solidify us in truth. So Psalm 1, we're going to dive in. Let's pray before we jump into the Word of God. Father, give us eyes that can see. You seem to assume, Jesus, that everyone you met had eyes that weren't working, ears that weren't listening, and hearts that were hard, not open. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Let your words not just fall on us like the seed fell on the hard soil or on the rocky Give us eyes to see that can actually hear and see and feel what you're trying to say to us, we pray in your name. Amen. Psalm 1 just simply says this, Blessed is the man or the woman who walk not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight, his delight is in the law, the instructions, the guidance, the promptings of the Lord. And on that prompting, that guidance, he meditates day and night, and he'll be like a tree planted or Maybe better transplanted, literally in the Hebrew. Maybe transplanted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. And everything that it does, he prospers. But the wicked, ah, not so. Not them. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. They get blown around. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked uh, perish. 
Note the immediate context we run into, a contrast of two different ways of life, a way of life that's based on truth and a way of life that's based on non-truth, untruth. One group are wicked, the other messed up. They're just a group of people that have made mistakes, they're jacked up. They just keep making the same mistakes probably over and over. Then you've got the sinners, the wicked, then sinners. The sinners are wayward, they're off course, and they've kind of committed themselves to being off course, and then you go even worse to the scoffers. These are the type of people who are unteachable and they're hard. They've decided to be hard. They're not just hard, they're settled on being hard. They're perfecting their hardness. And so we got people around us who are like this, and it moves from the general to the specific, from just being messed up to, no, they're intentionally messed up, and they're messing themselves up even and more. But note, while they're there, we don't walk in their ways. We don't stand along the same paths, and we don't find ourselves sitting in the same assembly. We just don't sit and listen to this. We may be with them, but we're not with them. You ever been with your parents while they were embarrassing you, and so you're kind of with them, but you're not really with them? Our kids used to follow us around. I found out when my kids got into teenage years, I could embarrass them without even trying. You might have one of those dads. Yes, we're with them, but we're not really with them. We're around them, but we're not letting them depict us and guide us because the Scriptures assume two ways of life. The Scriptures basically lay it out as it's this or that. You're righteous or you're wicked. Or you're blessed or you're perishing. In fact, if you got your own Bible, you want to mark something down. The first word in Psalm 1 is blessed, and the last word is perish. We've got our choice. We're blessed or we perish. We have a, a, ch a chance to make that decision. When my kids were young, I remember my wife used to have to challenge the two- and three-year-old in them, and she'd look at them and say, you get choice one or you get choice two, and that's it. And they just stare at us and glare because they didn't want choice one or choice two. They wanted choice three. But God doesn't give a choice three. It's righteous or non-righteous. It's blessed or perish. And we have to put on the belt of truth. And to do that, we have to avoid the distractions. And we need to focus our attention, Psalm 1 would say, before we can pray. And before we can pursue truth, we've got to bring our attention to bear on what? Well, the psalmist would say they are like a person whose delight is in the instructions of the Lord. We focus our attention on the instruction, the law, the guidance, the direction of the Lord. This applies to the Bible, but not just the Bible. It applies to every type of openness God gives us in every form. Because God is into doing things that are identity-shaping for us, life-giving for us. He prompts us, He guides us, He nudges us, He sometimes directs us. He can do it through other people or just directly in the same way that I can be tempted I can be pushed along the right direction by the Lord. And Scripture is a banquet full of stories and narratives of our family members all discovering what it's like to actually choose the righteous, not the wicked, the way, the way that's blessed and not the way that perishes. And if we have ears to hear it, we can find that our own lives are full of instruction from the Lord. So we focus our attention away from the distractions of the wicked onto the words and the promptings of God, but not only the words and promptings of God, even better, the interventions of God. He says, we're like a tree. I have transplanted trees in my yard. They picked those things up someplace else. They grew them. They grew them to a certain stage. They had a ball of roots. They pick them up. They bring them to the yard. They dug a big hole. They planted them. They put ropes on them, staked them out, pampered trees. And that's the way my life is, and that's the way your life is, because we're like transplanted trees. We're being taken care of. And what we're supposed to do, you and I, is we're supposed to be focusing our attention, not on all the distractions of the wicked around us, but on the words of God, as well as the deeds of God, the actions of God, the things God has done. And so, so many times, early in the morning in ministry, as I've been planting churches or leading other initiatives, I found myself waking up and wondering, how in the world can we fix this? Or how do I survive that? Or how is this going to work? And I can't tell you the number of times that the Word of God has helped me, but sometimes even more, just remembering the actions of God. Sometimes I just take my journal and start journaling and listing all the miracles God did in the Old Testament, and I just let myself write them down because at a certain point along the way, all of a sudden I find myself realizing my God is big enough to handle whatever I'm facing. I've got truth back on. I wake up and the, the belt's gone. But a few moments with the words of the Lord and the deeds of the Lord, the belt's back. I'm ready. I can tackle this again. 
And as we avoid the distractions and pay attention to the words and deeds of the Lord, we discover that there's such a transition and a contrast between being a person who's transplanted beside streams of water that sustain us or not sustain us. We're yielding fruit. We have leaves that don't wither. We have prospering in all that we do. And we're told that we're supposed to stop and meditate and ponder on all of this. And all of this sets before us the contrast here, again, between blessed and perishing. We have sinners, wicked, scoffers versus those who seek the instruction of God as part of our daily life. We have the contrast between a tree or a piece of chaff. We have the contrast between being rooted in life or being tossed about and blown. I don't know if you've met them yet, but there are people all around us, they live hard, and they're, tru- they're rootless, and they're blown, here they're in fr- fro, and they have no way of having truth in their life, or the enjoyment of streams of water, or a drought in life, or fruitfulness, or not fruitlessness, or the righteous in the wicked, or the judgment, or the perishing, or the trust in the truth of the Lord, or a life based on error. So where do we find this? We find it by paying attention to what God has done and said around us, His words, His works. Because I've discovered in 30-some years of ministry, ministry can leave you dry. It can wear you out. It can leave you hanging. Life can do it even without ministry, but if you're going to do it through life, it's already bad. Add ministry to the mix, it can sometimes be even worse. But that can be avoided by the pursuit of truth, by setting ourselves away from the distractions and focusing our attention, Psalm 1. Now, Psalm 2, I'm not going to read it with you. I just want to point your way there. Psalm 2 moves us in the same way from intimidation to adoration. Psalms 1 and 2, I think, are supposed to go together. That's why I'm covering them in one setting here. Number 1 begins with the word blessed. Blessed is the man, Psalm 1. Go to the very last word in the Hebrew in Psalm 2. It's the word blessed. Psalms 1 and 2 come together to show us the blessed life. Number one focuses on God's words and action. Number two focuses on God as the messianic king. And in Psalm 2, we have a simple showdown between all the powers of the world around us and God and his Messiah. And in that kind of context, we have a tendency to get fixated and focused on size, just like Saul and the children of Israel when they saw Goliath walk out into the valley. He's so big. Well, Psalm 2 basically says the same thing because we find ourselves feeling outsized, outnumbered. We're puny and they're giants. It says in Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his anointed. And all of them gather together and they're against us. And it's hard out there in the trenches to represent what God still teaches. Our new churches are trying to reach people who have no church background. There's no assumption in a new church that we have to believe this book, and yet we're trying to explain to people, here's the biblical way of life. My wife and I are throwing parties in our community. She's in charge of all the social activities in our local HOA, and they gave her a $5,000 budget to throw parties this year. So we're throwing parties, and we're finding out there are several same-sex couples in our community, several of which have adopted children. And they're in our home, and we're trying to get to know them, And they're glad that they're at the house. One of them the other night said, thank you for including us in the party. And I'm happy that they're there. I just know that the time is going to come, and I'm not sure when it's going to come, because they know I'm a minister, where we're going to have that chat. And I'm going to have to represent truth. And it's intimidating to be the one person in the neighborhood who's willing to stand for truth. But if I'm going to have the belt of truth around me, I have to not be distracted. I need attention on God's words and his works. There's Psalm 1. I also need to move from being intimidated by all the voices in our culture that say, that can't be. You can't say that any longer. That's hate speech. And I've got to be willing to stick with the Messiah. I have to become so adoring of the Messiah that no matter what others think, I take a stand for truth. So we meditate on these things. And everyone around us is rebelling. And what's God's response to the rebellion of all these kings and these people who want to throw off God and not have God as part of their life? Well, in verse 4, it says he sits in the heavens and he laughs. He holds them in derision. He just chuckles. He dismisses them with a wave of his hand because he says, I've established my king. I've established the Messiah. I've set Christ at the top, at the lead, at the head. He is the king. I tend to watch the news and I get all worked up and worried. I ask, what can I do? What can we do? And Psalm 2 moves me from what can I or we do to what has Christ done? What is our king 
done. I want to act. I feel powerless. And then I remember Messiah. In verse 12, he says, I just kiss the Son. I do homage to the Messiah. I pay attention to Christ, lest he be angry and I perish in my way, for his wrath is quickly land, kindled. But blessed is anyone and everyone who places their faith, their refuge in him. So what's our response as we live in a culture, as you get ready to be battle ready, and you're leaving here and going out into a church, or you're leaving here and going out into another career, or you're leaving here and perhaps going out to start a new church, because why join the Navy when you can be a pirate? Let's go and start something new. What is the response we're supposed to have? Well, we stop letting the rulers and the problems scare us. We stop in being intimidated and we just become adoring of our Lord. Psalm 2 moves us from, ador from intimidation to adoration. And I hope you can see in these two Psalms, we have a chance to put on a belt of truth. They move us toward truth. Like shovels, they uproot the distractions around us. Like shovels, they, take, they give us room for attentiveness. Like a, like a compass, they help us find our bearings and figure out where we are and it's a map. It's like a, a Garmin or the iPhone. It guides us in the directions we want to go. And even in the hands of the most rookie or unskilled amateur, Psalms 1 and 2 can take us toward truth. And I have to believe that some of us came in here today distracted and intimidated. Distracted by all the noise and the culture around us. Intimidated by all the voices that would tell us you can't believe what you believe. And perhaps we felt distracted or intimidated for so long we've not really realized that we are or we've forgotten what it's like to not be. But we can let that go by simply asking, what's God been saying to me lately? What's God been doing around me lately? And let's just try to remember who Jesus is. Let's just keep going back to the Lord. John wants us, Jesus wants us to know the truth. He wants us to understand it in grace. In John 17 and 3, he said, Now this is the eternal kind of life, that they may know you, the only God, Messiah, Jesus, whom you have sent. He says, This is the kind of life that you're supposed to have, that we would know God. Knowledge in the Bible is not just head knowledge. I know what you're in college, and a whole lot of what we have to do is learn the Hebrew. <laughs> Somebody was studying this morning in the cafeteria, and I saw them getting ready for a Hebrew test and thought, Oh my gosh, that's been a long time. I'm glad I'm out of that now. But it's not just head knowledge, it's actual experiential encounter. It says that Adam knew his wife Eve and they had a baby. Now that's knowing. Well, we're supposed to know God in an experiential encounter, in a close, personal, interactive relationship where we note his words, Psalm 1, where we note his deeds, Psalm 1, and where we just fix our attention on his son, which is Psalm 2. What I need, what I'm recommending that you need, is a sufficient spirituality. One that puts on the belt of truth. One that girdles it around you. It's a way of being that works in the moment of need. It's one that is sufficient. I know you might want an overwhelming, overpowering, staggering, really cool spirituality, and it's nice when those moments come. But there will be days, and there are days, where we wake up and what we need today is, I just need something that gets me through. Sufficient. It just needs to be enough to eke by sufficient. And I'll settle for that. I want one that stands up under the strain, that rises to the occasion. I want one that's bedrock, it's solid, it's useful, it's reliable, dependable, it's sufficient. And if I'm interested in obtaining a sufficient spirituality, one that'll stand at the test of time, I think it starts here. And I would recommend you start in the Psalms and just start reading them. Give yourself one for the week. We can talk about the theory of how it works. I can tell you this is a path that works. It's worked for thousands of years for many people. We teach ourselves to pray, not by learning how to pray on our own, but by using the prayers that were given us. Because they will move us into the words of God, into the deeds of God, and they will fixate our attention, not on all the voices that are around us trying to intimidate and shut us down. They will take us to the one that does rule. Jesus himself. So we pay attention to what's said by God, what's done by God, and what was incarnated by God. And then one day we'll wake up and realize we got the belt of truth. We're operating from real truth. Truth that's not just theory. Truth that I've lived, I've experienced, I feel it. I know God now. Father God, would you bless each and every one of us as we get ready to face the battles 
This is a great training place, and this is a wonderful time to get ourselves ready. Help us not to wait until we're out in the fields to start turning from the distraction and putting our attention on Christ, on your word and on, on your deeds. Help us, Lord, also not to be intimidated, but to give our adoration to your Son. And as we put on that belt of truth, help us to be a bright light to everyone around us that this is the way, the truth, the life, we pray. In his name, amen. Thank you.